I'm honored to introduce Smriti Rani to the audience, although she does not need any introductions. Smriti Rani is a senior leader of the Bharatiya Janata Party. She has held several important portfolios in the past, including being Minister for Education, Minister for Textiles, Minister for Minority Affairs, Minister for Information and Broadcasting, and from 2019 to 2024, she was Minister for Women and Child Development. If you look at her trajectory over the past few decades, it has been one where she has gone on to break many glass ceilings over and over again. From being a household name as a TV personality, to being a fiery politician, then to an astute parliamentarian, and then to a cabinet minister. You'll see that she has gone on from strength to strength. And she has done all of this while raising a rooted family and meeting the complex requirements of her many roles. She has also continued to reskill and upskill herself over this course. I was surprised to hear that in 2022, she took, she took a course in business analytics offered by the Judge Business School at Cambridge. She says, <laughs> according to her, living all these different roles together gracefully is what defines an Indian woman. Please put your hands together again for Smriti Rani. Welcome to Cambridge, ma'am. Please join us on the stage for your talk. Uh, it's titled, Leading Change, Women Shaping India's Century. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Shruti. Um, I've just told the gentleman outside that when Shruti and Smriti come together, we tend to make history. <laughs> the compliments made me very heady, but then it can also be the jet lag I'm suffering from. It is indeed an honor to speak today about how women are leading change. But let me reflect on the platform I sit on. I won't speak about the illustrious and those who are coveted across the world who come from this institution. But what does this institution do to those who come not from political pedigree, but from ordinary circumstances? I'm fascinated by a particular story, though I'm grateful that you mentioned my executive certificate from the Judge Business School. A very pesky father determined, ambitious about his son a son who spent most of his days running away from formal education, running after rats, shooting, chasing dogs, wanted nothing more than to just be intertwined with nature. The father, though English, almost behaved like an Indian parent, hoping to get a job for the child. He contacted the local church who said that the son could possibly get a job as a country parson if he got a degree from, let's say, Cambridge. So after much cajoling, the son takes an interest in his education, gets educated here, and is off to his job predetermined destiny till he finds a letter from a professor at Cambridge who says that I can give you an unpaid job on a ship if you decide to leave for five years. The child, much against the father's wishes, takes up the job offer, goes across the world sampling and sending back specimens to England. I won't name the father, but that child, who is now a legend, Darwin, his story speaks volumes about what institutions can do to ignite change through ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. So while I was looking through your history as an institution, uh, what fascinated me, especially when I want to speak about women shaping destinies and centuries for many nations across the world, I would like to quote a small article written by a lady student of MPhil in Education, Globalization, and International Development from the University of Cambridge. She says, that women invest 90% of their earnings in their families and communities as compared to 40% by gentlemen. Now, since it's from a student in Cambridge, let me highlight what Indian women are all about. 
I see that my cantankerous friend Sanjeev Sanyal has already spoken. And knowing his penchant for trouble, I am sure he has riled up many in the audience. But given that I'm a proud member of the world's oldest civilization and largest democracy, in a country where 968 million Indians are biometrically registered to vote, 642 million Indians turned up, of which 310 million are women. Today, when I look at the status of women in India, what do I find? Of the 432 Indian women who are of working age, 343 million women are in the unorganized sector. And amongst all the women who are financially disenfranchised today, I'm happy to share that over 270 million Indian women now have access to financial instruments in financial institutions, courtesy a government program. But more than what governments can do, what do these women do? Much is said about women CEOs across various institutions and companies in the world, but not many know that while in India, 8% of our CEOs are women, the global average is 6%, which means in India, we are possibly a step ahead than the rest of the world, but we have much catching up to do. If I look at female leadership, which is astounding in certain fields, in education and training, women leadership is close to 45%. In charity organizations, we are at 47%. Now let's look at laws, particularly made for women. Women and men across the world have fought for centuries, decades, equal work and equal pay. That being said, as a woman, what gladdens my heart is that in India, a non-controversial bill was passed. Why non-controversial? Because if this bill was introduced in the Western world, there would be societal and political divisions. Medical termination of pregnancy at 24 weeks. Try that in any other country other than India and you will have a public furor. As an Indian woman, I'm proud that it was passed not only in both houses of parliament, but it was passed with the support of men and women alike. Today, as I sit before you and we look at how India fares vis-a-vis -vis women, I'm happy to share that while the law mandates that essentially enlisted companies, at least one woman has to be on the board. Gentlemen, what is fascinating is that 22.6% women who are on boards hold positions in more than one board as compared to just 12% men. Which means that when women find that one foot through the door, through their productive contributions to their organizations, they keep the flag flying high, not only for their organization, but are valuable for organizations across the board. Not demeaning or devaluing, possibly the contribution of men. I can proudly say today that according to the Global Board Diversity Tracker, we have more women in Indian boardrooms higher than the global average. Why am I giving you these numbers? Because if you're sitting in the shadow of Sanjeev Sanyal, numbers matter. <laughs> and I say this. Of the 500 million bank accounts that were open in India in the past decade, 56% yes belong to women. But what is fascinating is that 67% of them were opened in rural and semi-urban India. And what is fascinating is that the World Bank Global Findex report now says that India no longer has a gender gap in account ownership. I proudly say today as an Indian that when banks look at women, they have resolutely said that a female's lifetime revenue 
is 12% higher than men. India has made a case for financial emancipation of women across the world. Today, 130 million Indian women are part of the government's pension scheme and insurance scheme voluntarily. Today, of the 300 million loans sanctioned only to Indian female entrepreneurs, we see that they own close to eight and a half million enterprises in India, which employs over 13 and a half million people in my country. So since numbers speak, let me say this. There has been a presumption if a female owns a business, it may be inclined towards traditional modems. However, today I proudly say that of the eight and a half million enterprises that are owned and operated by Indian women, 29% of them are in the manufacturing sector and close to 18% of them are in the business of trade. Today, when you talk about fiscal emancipation of women, many academics say that it is essential so that we can enhance the decision-making capacity of women in our families, in our communities. I'm happy to share with you that of the 16 states and eight union territories in India that were canvassed by academicians, a report suggests that decision-making capacities of women in urban Indian families now stands at 91%, and in rural Indian families now stands at 87%. I am also happy to share with you that in these hallowed halls of learning, 43% of our STEM graduates are women. So if India is going to Mars or the dark side of the moon, be assured that those leading that project are definitely the women at ISRO. While our women, and I proudly say this, are at the frontiers of technology and science, I happily also share today, as an erstwhile minister, that I had the constitutional opportunity to pay salutations to the Supreme Commander of the Indian Armed Forces, that being the President of India, Draupadi Murbo. Belonging to a tribal family, began her career with the distinct aptitude, educationally empowered so that she could teach others in her village. This woman went from one constitutional position to another and now gently yet firmly sits on one of the most formidable armies in the world. That is the capacity, aptitude, and the standard that Indian women have set. However, knowing that I normally don't tend to be very disciplined about sticking to just the adage I'm supposed to speak on. I wonder why we would speak about women shaping India's century. India has now made a case for how women are crucial for development globally. As India today, in the G20 presidency, has enunciated and illustrated that when we have opportunities to lead globally, we bring the cause of women to the center of the discourse. I, who have been witness to many G20 deliberations today, can proudly say that for years on end, we were delegated to small rooms of conversation with NGOs, charity organizations, for that is where issues of women were to be delegated. India under the leadership of a man that too, brought women-led development to the center of discourse at the G20. Because we know that when you want to build back and build better, you better build with women as equal partners. So why do you need to have women lead change, not only in India, but across the world? Well, to quote the Harvard Center for International Development, if a girl's income is to increase by 25% every year, keep her in school. If you invest 
only $300 million in research on women, there is academic proof that the return in reducing healthcare cost and increasing productivity of the global workforce will be to the tune of $13 billion. Today, if we in India add one more percent of girls to our secondary education system, our GDP would rise by $5.5 billion. Today, if I look at global SMEs which are owned by women, we women in business and small businesses are currently underfunded by $1.7 trillion. However, if you invest in women-owned businesses, you close the credit gap and 12% is the average income annual increase that all genders will see across the board by 2030. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful that I'm given an opportunity today to speak about how women can lead change. As an Indian woman, I say this, we as a civilization have always believed in Vasudeva Kutumbakam, that we are one family. And in a family, if everybody goes to, grows together, then everybody survives and thrives. If we want globally as a union, as a community, as a family to grow, let's invest in women. And that's my case as an Indian woman. So we'll open the podium to the audience for Q&A. So we'll just take three questions, so be very brief. Um, thank you so much, it was a great speech. Uh, my question is that young women in India are now carving and also craving space in Indian politics. What would be your one advice for them and how best could a young woman in India start her career in politics? Well, I will say this. Get ready for the enforcement of the 33% reservation in the Indian Parliament. <laughs> and if you need somebody to strategize for you, if you need somebody to draw up a campaign plan, I'm always available to help free of charge. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Smriti ji. I'm uh, Vidya Chaudhary from Bangalore, all the way from India, Bangalore. My question is, uh, somebody like me who's been working in the NGO sector for the last 20 years, have a serious interest in the polity of India, 33% uh, reservation in politics aside, there's very little opportunity for people, women like us to enter the polity directly unless you go through the party lines, hold the flags and scream slogans, give TV interviews what is the shortest way because mid 50s i have another 15 years active uh, work life Madam, left there's perhaps. never a shortcut to success <laughs> well, i'm not talking about success i'm just talking about participation active participation for participation in you need to decide which block of the democracy would you like to be a party to not political party but just like i told the young lady about 33% reservation in parliament if you seek to begin your career as a panchayat member, as a sarpanch, you can fight that local election at the village level where you have 50% reservation. Today we have close to 1.5 million women who win and over 2.5 million women who actually fight elections at the grassroots. They don't belong to pedigreed families. Their victory not only is celebrated, but today there is academic and administrative evidence that women, especially in local governance who win, contribute more to the HDI in that particular community than comparatively men. So women in administration, women in local governance, women in grassroots politics have made a case for more and more women to get equal opportunity to compete and win. <laughs> 